so okay, in honor of the Horn's victory in the Sugar Bowl, I've got to tell a football story, right? You know, you just got to tell a football story this time of year. You, some of you will remember who I'm talking about. That will really show your age, so I'm not going to ask you if you remember. But John Cassis was a, was a great motivational speaker. He was also the chaplain for the Chicago Bears in their glory years of the 80s. He tells a story about when the Chicago Bears coach, Mike Ditka, was about to deliver a locker room pep talk before the game. He looked up and he saw defensive tackle William Refrigerator Perry. Okay, how many of you remember Fridge Perry? Okay, it's a huge man. I mean, he was so big and fast, you know, they even used him as a fullback on the one yard line. He looked up and saw Perry and he said, uh, Fridge, when I get finished, I'd like you to close with the Lord's Prayer. And then the coach began his talk. In the audience was Jim McMahon. Now, Jim McMahon was not uh, anybody's excuse for a Christ follower, and, and he was sitting in the, in, in the locker room with him, and, and uh, he nudged John Cassis, and he said, look at Fridge. He, he doesn't know the Lord's Prayer. Sure enough, they looked at Perry, and he had a look of panic on his face. He was sweating profusely, and, and Cassis said, and, no, Jim, everybody knows the Lord's Prayer. Everybody knows the Lord's Prayer. And McMahon said, no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. I'll bet you 50 bucks Fridge Perry does not know the <laughs> Lord's Prayer. So they got on through the pep talk, and when Coach Ditka finished, he asked all the men to remove their helmets, and he nodded at Perry and bowed his head. He was quiet for a few moments. Then the Fridge spoke in a shaky voice. Now I lay me down to sleep and pray the Lord my soul to keep. Because <laughs> he felt a tap on his shoulder of the Jim McMahon. Here's 50 bucks. I had no idea Perry knew the Lord's prayer. <laughs> we are here to know God's prayer. Apply God's word. And we're here to live life according to God's word and, and God's will. To live life as God intends for us to live. To live joyfully. To live robustly. To live enthusiastically. To live life fully lived. What Jesus wants for us without fear, without imprisonment, without imprisonment to what I call wants, worries, and wealth. I get that from Mark chapter 4 and a couple of the other gospels. You remember the parable of the sower who sows the seeds and at the end of that parable, he says of the first three soils, the word was choked out by the deceitfulness of wealth, the worries of this life, and the wants for other things. And that's what happens to a lot of us. Wants, worries, and wealth choke out the word of God. And yet our lesson tonight tells us that grace sets us free. The grace of the gospel sets us free to live life fully lived. Tonight we'll look at the beginning of the second journey of grace. Last week we looked at the first journey of grace and how, how Paul had traveled through parts of Asia Minor and spread the gospel to cities there and then and then was called to Jerusalem to explain his idea of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you remember the Council of Grace. Most we'll call it the Council of Jerusalem. But I call it the Council of Grace. They settled the issue once and for all that man and woman are saved by 
grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, and armed with this realization that the gospel was the same as being spread by all the gospel writers and all the, all the apostles and all the disciples, Paul and Silas take out on the second missionary journey, the, the second journey of grace. They go through Derby and then to Lystra where they pick up Timothy. And Timothy and Paul and Silas travel throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia. They decide to go, they decide to go north toward Russia. And, and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus says, no, that's not the way I want you to go. That, that door is closed to you right now. And, and so sometimes we learn that in God's will there is negative guidance. When, when God saves us from some place we ought not to go and, and instead directs us to a different place, a different task, a different mission that he has in mind. When God closed the door to Asia temporarily, he opened the door to Greece, which then opened the door to Rome, which then opened the door to England, which then opened the door to America. And, and Paul didn't whine, he didn't complain. It's as though Paul said, okay, God, you don't want me to go over that way? Which way do you want me to go? Will you show me the way? And God says, sure, I'll show you the way. And, and gives Paul a vision of the man of Macedonia. and says, I want you to go toward Greece. And they did. They took out across the water and they went to Neapolis and then landed at Philippi where they stayed for several days. And there being no church, of course, and there being no synagogue in Philippi, they, they went down to the beach, good place to go, and they found a place of prayer. Some women who were gathered there, one of those listening was a woman named Lydia, dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. She was a deist. She probably knew Yahweh. The Father God, but she hadn't yet been introduced to the Son, Jesus Christ. And so the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message of grace, to the gospel of salvation. And she did. She responded. Maybe not in your translation, but my translation said, and, and so was established the first daytime community Bible study. Right there in Philippi, Lydia was the first core leader. <laughs> I wonder if she did our lesson. No, no, it wasn't yet. Yeah, Lydia is an interesting person, really, isn't she? A real, a real fashionista, right? I mean, you, you've heard that the devil wears Prada, but did you know that angels wear Lydia? <laughs> and, and this first part of our story is about two circumcisions, isn't it? The circumcision of Timothy and the circumcision of Lydia, right? The circumcision of, of Timothy. God cut away his Gentileness. God cut away his old self. God cut away his bonds to the world, his conformity to the world. And in the circumcision of Lydia, if you will, God cut away the callous around her heart that had prevented her from hearing and understanding the gospel, the message of salvation by grace. He made Lydia able to understand in her heart the gospel. Timothy was circumcised for the sake of others. <coughs> Lydia was circumcised in her heart for her sake. Timothy was circumcised so that the gospel could spread. Lydia 
Lydia's heart was circumcised so that she could be transformed. And so Lydia is, Lydia is transformed by the gospel of grace, and so too are two other unlikely prospects. You know, if, if Paul had been an NFL coach at that time, do you suppose he would pick Lydia and a slave girl and a prison guard to be on his team? What an unlikely lot for the, for the church at Philippi. Paul and Silas were there in Philippi, and when they were going to the place of prayer, they were met by a slave girl, a crazy girl. The word for fortune teller means she's manic. She's a maniac, even though she's telling part the truth. That's what Satan does, doesn't he? He makes the lies with the truth. And, and Paul got irked at that. He says, you have no business being an agent of Satan and speaking the gospel. And interestingly, he rebuked the spirit. He didn't rebuke the girl. He saved the girl. He rebuked the spirit. And immediately, the spirit left her. For the, for the one that is in you is greater than the one that is in the world. But, but the crowd didn't like it, right? They were out for profit. They were out for money. She was their meal ticket. They incensed a crowd to attack Paul and Silas, who were severely flogged and thrown into prison, guarded carefully in an inner cell with their feet in stocks. You read the story. Don't you wish you'd have been there? Just like we talked about with Peter and being saved from his jail cell. So about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God, just exactly like you would have done, right? Sitting there in the stocks in the inner cell in the dungeon and praising the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this prison cell. Thank you for these shackles. Thank you for, for letting me spread the gospel to these prisoners. Thank you for letting me be a witness to even the lowest of the low. A violent earthquake. Shook the foundations of the prison and the doors flew open and the chains came loose and the jailer woke up. He said, my goodness, my bosses aren't going to like this at all. Everybody's going to escape. And, and Paul and Silas are, are more concerned with the salvation of the jailer than they are with their own safety. On their way to escape, they stop and they say, wait a minute. We've got to take care of this guy. And, and, and the astounded jailer remembers that they had been spreading a gospel of salvation, a way to be saved. And he says, how, how could this be true? I see that it must be true. How can I be saved? Paul said, you know what? It's profound, but it's simple. Believe in Jesus. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And, and if your household also trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, they also will be saved. And, and the Lord opened the heart of the jailer and the household, and they, they trusted in Jesus. They were saved, and as Evidence of their salvation, they were baptized to show the world the gospel of grace is true. I, I hope you circled verse 23 and drew a line across to, to verse 39. I, I love the context here. The, the world and then the Holy Spirit, you know? So, so they're severely flogged, they're thrown into prison, they're guarded carefully, but then after the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit, boy, things change, right? When you involve the Holy Spirit, look out, man, he changes the world because now the magistrates come to appease them, come to escort them from the prison. <laughs> Would you guys please leave? We set out this red carpet for you. How the Holy Spirit changes lives and changes circumstances. A, a tale of, of three conversions. 
And isn't it ironic that, that an Orthodox Jewish man every day would pray and thank the Lord, thank God that he had not made him a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. And who are the three converts? A Gentile, a slave, and a woman. The gospel of grace turns the world upside down. Lydia, Lydia from the upper class, the jailer from the middle class, the slave girl from the lowest of low classes, Lydia Rich, the jailer, an hourly wage earner, the slave girl, nothing. She has nothing. She is nothing. Lydia wears a purple collar. The jailer wears a blue collar. A slave girl wears a monkey grandeur's collar. And Paul appeals to each of them differently. Paul appeals to Lydia's mind and explains the gospel. He, uh, he appeals to the slave girl's heart and her spirit and changes her spirit. And he appeals to the jailer. He tells him of God's grace. And all three hear the same message, but in a different way, that grace sets us free. Grace sets us free. It set free Lydia from the prison of materialism to the grace of generosity. It set the slave girl free from the, from the prison of possession, possession by others, possession of of what others thought of her, possession of, of what others made her do to, to the freedom of living life fully. And the gospel of grace freed the jailer from fear of consequences, fear of, of doing the wrong thing, a fear of paying the penalty for, for upsetting others to the freedom to the freedom of service for others without thought of himself. I thought, I thought verse 26 was so interesting and, and such a picture of the gospel. For the gospel is like an earthquake. The gospel shakes the foundation of prisons. The gospel opens prison doors gospel breaks down the chains of slavery. The gospel wakes those who are asleep. The gospel makes enemies into friends. And the gospel blesses those who are persecuted for the name of Jesus. So what now? Right? How am I to respond to closed doors? How am I to respond to open doors? How am I to respond to frustrate? Am I to, to respond to closed doors with frustration, with anger, with discouragement, and quit? Do I respond to open doors with timidity, with indecisiveness, with fear of making a mistake? Some of you know I've been blessed to, to teach in India, I taught over 500 pastors there. And I was scheduled to go back again here in two weeks, and, and India decided differently, rejected my visa. It, it's kind of interesting. I, I talked to the concierge that I was using to get my, my visa, and they said, uh, what did you put down as your profession? I said, business person. What you put, put down as purpose for your, for your visit? I said, tourism, like everybody else. They said, what was your email address? I said, well, wchapman at rashchapman.com. He said, they Googled you. They found out you're a lawyer. They don't let lawyers in India. <laughs> but it wasn't India. It, it was God who closed that door. So instead of me spending $3,000 to fly to India for 97,000 hours, <laughs> I, 
I have made videos of the 10 session walk through the Bible that I teach and for $15 I'll send a video to India where before I was going to teach 500 pastors now maybe God will use the walk through the Bible to reach 1 billion unsaved Hindu souls if God wants so like Paul we don't we don't cry over spilled milk, do we? we? We look for the open door. We pray about it. We be patient as we're waiting. And we wait in expectation that God will open a door. That God will answer our prayers. And we look for exit signs. You see exit signs everywhere, you know? In here, in the, in the theory. Exit signs are throughout throughout the Bible. They're, they're like a door to safety. That's what an exit sign is. Every time when you see a, an exit sign, I want you to think that's a door to safety. And it's, a, and it's the gospel. You see, the gospel is an exit sign to the safety of salvation away from the world, away from the prison of the world, away from the fire and the dangers of the world. It says, leave the world, exit this way, and be saved. Lydia and the jailer were exit signs, but, but they weren't the exit sign themselves, were they? They weren't the gospel themselves. They were, they were no, the mean, no more the means of salvation than, than, than a person who thinks he's a car because he lives in a garage, you know? That, that, living in a garage doesn't make you a car, and... and and living in a family of believers doesn't make you a believer. And so the exit sign is there for each of us to accept the Lord Jesus Christ individually. So we need to exit the, the prisons of the world. Exit what worries you. You know, I... Worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Exit the deceitfulness of wealth. Exit the desire for things other than Jesus. Jesus said, I came to give you life and life abundantly, robustly, joyfully, letting it with gusto. But Pat and I went to Sanibel Island over, over New Year's. And I took the chance to sleep late, and Pat took the chance to get up early, and she's walking the beach one morning. She's walking along, enjoying the beach. Here comes, here comes a woman, a, Pat said, clearly over 60 years old, but hard as a rock clearly works out and she's jogging down the beach and then she plops down on the beach and does 10 push-ups then she jumps up and grabs her bar and does 10 10 setups and and pat says oh my gosh i'd love to be like you and the woman looked at pat and she said why not you can do this why not that's our motto for the year why not live live life with gusto why not Live it with joy. Why not? You are saved by the gospel of grace. So we make New Year's resolutions, and most of them are to do something. Or most of them are to not do something else. <coughs> Instead, I encourage you to be something. Make a resolution to be. To be who God wants you to be. Fully alive. For the gospel of grace sets us free. Let's pray. O oh God of infinite grace, we have celebrated the gift of your Son. We have worshipped at the manger. Amazed by this gift so undeserved, Messiah the perfect one. 
Now we look at the new year and acknowledge this gift of coming days, a blank journal for aspirations. May we hear only you and determine your will before we fill every page. Let our schedule not be controlled by the speed at which our feet can move or the agility of our hands, but placed at your feet, we trust in your timing. Give us grace to wait for you. Keep our hands busy doing your kingdom's work and not our own pursuits. Our eyes and thoughts fixed steadily on you. Make the soil of our heart pliable and rich so that your word can take root. Above all, Fill our hearts full of worship and gratefulness every hour when the new year becomes the daily grind. Let our food be your truth, your presence our God, living not in our strength, but in your power. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.